Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Simon Finfer. I'm an intensive care physician in Sydney, Australia and a member of the executive board of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to welcome everyone to the Second World Sepsis Congress brought to you by the Global Sepsis Alliance and the World Sepsis Day Movement. We're going to start with um, some welcome words and some video presentations before we move to the live sessions. And should you wish to answer any question, ask any questions, please type them into the public audience chat and we will be monitoring those and answering um, as many as we can as appropriate. So our first uh, presentation um, and welcome comes from Dr. Tedros Adhanam, the Director General of the WHO, which is very appropriate considering the WHO's recent resolution to try and improve sepsis care around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the World Health Organization. Every year, around 31 million people develop sepsis and 6 million of them die. That's 11 people every single minute. As usual, it's the poor who bear the heaviest burden. Sepsis is a major cause of infant and maternal mortality in low- and middle-income countries. Antimicrobial resistance also increases the risk of patients developing sepsis and septic shock. We can stop sepsis by stopping the infections that lead to it through vaccination, better infection prevention and control practices, and other improvements in communities and health facilities. The best way to improve sepsis outcomes is to strengthen health systems. We must increase access to primary health care improve maternity services, and ensure that newborn care units have skilled health workers with the right diagnostic tools, essential medicines, water, and sanitation. WHO is working with countries to develop policies and strategies and implement standards to prevent, diagnose, and treat sepsis. Thank you for your commitment. We rely on your energy and expertise as we work together to create a healthier, safer, fairer world. I thank you. So that was a welcome from the Director General of the WHO and I think he has touched there on many of the issues that will be covered during uh, online Congress um, with many of the world experts um, that we've brought together to cover those issues including such matters as antimicrobial resistance and improving health um, services, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. Uh, our next message comes from Dr. Helga Braun, who is the Minister for, of State to the Federal Chancellor of Germany and who has been a great supporter of both this Congress and the World Sepsis Day movement uh, since its inception. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to address the Second World Sepsis Congress. Some of you might remember I also addressed the first Congress two years ago. The theme of the opening session then was Sepsis, a global threat. Today it is Sepsis, still a global threat. So what's the difference? First of all, the syndrome itself has not changed. It is complicated and a frequent cause of death and connected with all sorts of infectious diseases. It really remains a threat to our societies. However, what has changed in recent years is our perception of sepsis. It's not longer sidelined by other urgent matters. One of the most remarkable actions in the fight against sepsis has been the resolution on sepsis adopted by the 7th World Health Assembly last year. Germany was one of the initiators. Thanks to the resolution, improving the prevention, diagnosis and management of sepsis have become a public health priority, which really makes it a game changer. Secondly, 
the International Cooperation to Combat Infectious Diseases and Antimicrobial Resistance and to Strengthen Health Systems has become much stronger. The German government also helped to foster this international cooperation during the German G7 and G20 presidencies, where health was one of our priorities. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the major results of the German G20 presidency is that WHO's central coordinating role in international crisis response is now widely accepted. WHO also enjoys wide support of its new emergency program and the structural reforms that go with it. From our point of view, the World Health Organization is successfully implementing the necessary changes. As a first tangible result, the recent Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo was successfully contained. New structures like the Contingency Fund for Emergencies make the necessary financial means available. Of course, we have to strengthen international capacities for crisis response further. The G7 stands up to its commitment to support 76 vulnerable countries in building up the necessary structures. We are also on a good way ahead in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. There is a huge international awareness of the problem now. Countries are implementing national action plans for a prudent use of antibiotics. The, necess the, the necessity for monitoring resistances and proper education of health personnel and the public. Furthermore, there is strong international support to develop new antibiotics and diagnostics. One hallmark is the new global AMR R&D hub that was envisaged by the G20 in Hamburg last year and was inaugurated in May at the margins of the this year's World Health Assembly. The hub will increase investments into R&D and will further improve the coordination efforts to efficient spending in those investments. Last but not least, there is enhanced international collaboration for the strengthening of health systems. Functioning health systems are the number one priority in our efforts to reach university, universal health coverage, which is one of the most important health-related goals in the 2030 Agenda. Especially in our fight against sepsis, intact health systems are paramount. Diagnosing sepsis is not always easy and urgent treatment is required. The earlier a patient has access to treatment, the better are the chances of survival. Together with President Akufo Addo of Ghana and the Norwegian Prime Minister Solberg, Chancellor Merkel has asked WHO Director General Tedros to moderate the development of a global action plan for healthy lives and well-being for all. The action plan should streamline efforts to relevant global actors and contain concrete milestones of the way to 2030. The concept for this action plan will be presented during this year's World Health Summit and the Grain Challenges meeting of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Berlin in October. We are very much looking forward to this event. And of course, there are other events due. On September 26, the United Nations will address tuberculosis, which can as well lead to sepsis. Next year, the United Nations will address the topic of um, UHC. In addition, Japan has already announced that the health will stay on their priority list for their next year's G20 presidency. Let me close by encouraging you all of not to stop but to further advance your efforts and international collaboration on health matters. I wish you know all a fruitful Congress. So those were some very important words from Helga Braun, the Minister of State for the Federal Chancellor of Germany. And as he um, stated in that, Germany was the country that proposed the WHO resolution, which has led to a good deal of activity around the world. 
um, not least of which has been the formation of some regional sepsis alliances working to improve the diagnosis, prevention and management of sepsis in their relevant areas of the world. One of those is the European Sepsis Alliance and the next presentation comes from Dr. Vitenis Andriakartis, who is the European Commissioner for Health and Food Safety, who was present at the inauguration of the European Sepsis Alliance uh, earlier this year. Ladies and gentlemen, as a doctor, I know firsthand the terrible consequences of sepsis. I have seen the complications leading patients to very serious conditions, such as amputations, that can affect people for the rest of their lives and even death. In fact, every year in the EU, more than 46,000 people die directly because of sepsis. And the number of deaths where sepsis is a contributing factor is at least 10, 15 times higher. But this is not only a European problem. Worldwide, the World Health Organization estimates that sepsis causes 6 million deaths per year and is responsible for around a half of all deaths in children under 5. That is worth repeating. Sepsis is responsible for half of all the deaths in children under 5. In this context, I strongly believe that the World Sepsis Congress can play a key role in promoting and enhancing global awareness and action on sepsis. As European Commissioner for Health and as a surgeon, I am committed to reducing the toll of sepsis in Europe and globally. And the European Union plays an important supporting role in this fight. Every single preventable death is unacceptable, and we all need to do more to eliminate amenable and avoidable death. This starts with improving the prevention of infections throughout our health system, developing new antimicrobials, vaccines, and other means to treat infections, and using antibiotics more appropriately. So what does that mean in practice? Well, I want to touch on three examples of our work in the EU and internationally. Firstly, they have been working in the area of infections for some time. In 2009, European Union member states approved a council recommendation on patient safety, including prevention and control of healthcare-associated infections. In the years since, many member states have implemented stricter hygiene requirements, monitoring and control measures, as well as detailed plans to reduce infection. And the Commission is supporting this action by funding various initiatives and research and reporting on progress. We are co-funding with member states a joint action to develop good practices and to exchange information on infection prevention and control, which will run until 2020. And the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control is coordinating surveillance of bloodstream infections and the healthcare associated infections across the EU. Secondly, I want to touch on antibiotics which save lives every day in every corner of the globe. But resistance to antibiotics is growing and is a major cause of sepsis death in Europe and worldwide. We urgently need to safeguard the antimicrobials we have and we need to strengthen our arsenal with new and improved antimicrobials. We are taking important steps in this direction, guided by the new European One Health Action Plan against antimicrobial resistance. This aims to make the EU a best practice region in fighting AMR, to boost research, development and innovation, and to shape the global agenda in order to prevent resistant infections and combat AMR collectively. 
Of course, AMR has huge implications across the globe, and as such, it requires a global response. You, healthcare workers, policy makers, funders, and members of the public all have important roles to play, for example, in promoting vaccination or stopping the use of antibiotics without medical prescription. AMR, like sepsis, affects all of us. So I urge you to make this fight your own. And I am encouraging to see that AMR is a focus of this Congress too. As I said earlier, sepsis is not just a European problem. Infections do not respect borders any more than AMR does. So, as a third example of our work, I want to mention our efforts to reinforce global engagement. This includes supporting international organizations such as the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development and the World Health Organization. And of course, it involves working closely with non-EU countries. Through our programs of development cooperation, we are working to strengthen health systems in many low-income countries, focusing also on patient safety, vaccination, and achieving universal health coverage. In the past 10 years, the EU has invested more than 96 million euros in sepsis-related research. We are also supporting the development of new therapies or preventive approaches that use individual responses. This will enable more rapid and personalized treatments. And I want to take this opportunity to encourage further investment by other global actors in these areas. In 2017, the World Health Organization adopted a resolution on improving prevention, diagnosis, and clinical management of sepsis. This represented a huge step in the right direction. The creation of the African Sepsis Alliance, the European Sepsis Alliance, the Hard Tomb Resolution, and similar initiatives illustrate the important progress that has been made. The momentum is there. Now, let's build it on and strengthen our collective efforts to prevent and treat this condition. The World Sepsis Congress is important in this regard, by raising awareness globally, coordinating stakeholders and driving action, we can prevent so many pointless deaths. And the diverse range of high-level experts participating over these two days is further evidence of the determination to prevent and manage sepsis. Let's make the most of this expertise and this engagement. And on, the, on that note, I wish you a productive and insightful Congress. We have two more um, video um, presentations before we move into some live presentations. Um, and I think what we've heard so far, although many of us may be clinicians concerned with the bedside care of patients, um, that getting the political backing and buy-in of governments and global organizations to assist and provide the resources to enable us to do our jobs when we're looking after individual patients is very important and we are making significant progress. So our next presentation comes from Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, who is the Assistant De Director General for Universal Health Coverage and Health Systems at the World Health Organization and who has been um, intimately engaged in helping us to enact the World Health Assembly resolution on improving the pre diagnosis, prevention, and management of sepsis. Distinguished participant, dear colleagues, good morning. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Second World Sepsis Congress opening session. This online congress is an excellent opportunity to connect virtually from around the world to discuss the latest evidence and experience about sepsis. 
both community and healthcare acquired sepsis represent a huge global burden, estimated to be around 31 million cases every year, 6 million of which result in death. One in 10 patients worldwide acquires at least one healthcare-associated infection, which often results in sepsis. Annually, in low- and middle-income countries, there is an estimated 6.9 million episodes of possible severe bacterial infection in neonates, of which around 3 million may need intensive care. Antimicrobial resistance is a major factor determining the poor clinical response to treatment. Now, the global community recognizes that AMR is one of the biggest challenges for us in this century. For example, case fatality rates are at least double for healthcare-associated pathogens that are non-susceptible to antibiotics such as MRSA. These numbers I mentioned are very likely to be underestimated as they are delivered from high-income settings. This is why there is an urgent need for reliable data on sepsis, especially from low-middle-income countries. To bridge this gap, in 2017, WHO coordinated a global prevalence study on maternal sepsis in over 500 facilities around 53 countries. The result will be issued very soon, and they will also help understand how maternal sepsis is prevented and treated worldwide. Sepsis is a complex agenda that requires multidisciplinary approach, taking into account to the reality of different patient groups and settings. Investment in prevention must come first. Infection leading to sepsis are avoidable through health education, vaccination, basic infection control, and improvement in water and sanitation and nutrition, both in the community and in healthcare. Early diagnosis and appropriate clinical management of sepsis are important, and for them, we need to strengthen health system. Sepsis is a powerful and practical indicator to evaluate resilience and quality of health system. Sepsis is a mirror which reflects the quality of care. That is why we work together and run each other to tackle sepsis. I would like to call upon all stakeholders to contribute to these challenges and to move this agenda forward jointly and effectively. I wish you all a very successful Congress and look forward to its outcome. Thank you very much. So our last um, pre-recorded presentation before we move to the live presentations comes from Dr. Jeremy Farrar, who is the director of the Wellcome Trust, a very important global funding organization and himself um, intimately involved in sepsis research and management over the years with uh, over 17 years of work in Vietnam. So here's Dr. Farrar. Thank you very much for the invitation to join the Second World uh, Sepsis Conference. Um, it's a brilliant idea, reaching out to parts of the world which traditional conferences won't do and addressing an issue which I think is of huge importance. Um, my name is Jeremy Farrar, I'm the head of Wellcome Trust, uh, a background in infectious diseases and having spent the last 18 or so years living in Vietnam, um, real appreciation of what the importance of, of sepsis is and sepsis management. And actually, although I think sepsis itself is hugely important, I think actually we need to think of it actually in an even bigger scale than we perhaps sometimes do. Um, it is about critical care. It's about critical care medicine, and it's about how we make sure that that is available globally to everybody that needs it. It is integral, as I'm sure Dr. Tedros talked about earlier, 
Um, it is integral to universal health coverage. Um, being able to look after the sickest patients in society is critical to the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 3, um, health and well-being. If we can get how to look after the sickest patients of any age in any part of the world, this independent of actually what they're suffering from, then the whole of the healthcare system will be better for it. Uh, and I think overall the sepsis community, if I could describe it as that, needs to essentially think of itself as bigger than it perhaps often does. Um, and really encourage um, the hosts of this, Flavia, Simon and, uh, and Conrad, just to think in that way of, of what it, of the sepsis community, the critical care community can do to the broader context. What I mean by that is, is um, that this has implications beyond the narrow sphere of the intensive care units. Um, if we think of some of the great challenges of our time, um, drug resistant infections, um, uh, emerging infections, two areas I'll focus on a little bit over the next few minutes. Uh, the sepsis community and the broader critical care community have got, a, I believe, an underappreciated role in, in both of those areas. Um, at this phase in the development of drug resistant infections globally, uh, the biggest impact will actually be felt in the sickest patients in our society. Um, the critical care uh, facility, people coming in with severe sepsis, uh, is often actually the place that emerging infections are first identified. They are, in a sense, the canary in the coal mine of uh, unusual but maybe critically important emerging infections starting to develop. If you go back over the last 20 years and look at all of the emerging infectious disease uh, epidemics um, and pandemics that we've suffered from, so I'm there thinking of uh, Nipah uh, in Malaysia in 1998, 1999, through to Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo 2018. Uh, you look at MERS in the Middle East, Zika in Central and South America, uh, bird flu in Southeast Asia, uh, MERS in the Middle East. If you ask yourself where each of those major issues were first identified, it was with a very sick individual coming in to a critical care facility and often being treated to begin with as if they had sepsis. Um, getting that initial treatment is critical, uh, but also getting that information to flow from those critical care facilities into public health, and into then the epidemic response uh, has been absolutely critical. And, and the sepsis community uh, has got an absolutely critical role to play in the early identification of those very sick individuals that need that specialist care and they need to feed that in in a totally integrated way into the public health response. Um, it's, a, it's an element of critical care, it's an element of sepsis uh, management that I think has been underestimated, but hugely, hugely important in being prepared for and responding to those epidemics. In drug resistant infections, which are you, everybody in the sepsis community uh, is very well used to handling now, but it will often be the coming of uh, drug resistance, which again will be maybe first identified within the sepsis community and within the critical care facilities where those patients are looked after. But also in, in finding solutions to those problems because of the capacity within those um, uh, critical care facilities to do clinical scientific studies that can perhaps only be done in those uh, environments gives an opportunity to really bring critical care microbiology, pharmacology, critically, PK and PD understanding to better improve the treatment, both of those patients with sepsis, but also patients that are not in the critical care facility. Uh, and that ability for the critical care sepsis community to see their role not just within the confines of an intensive care unit, but to see it as critically improving public health in the um, way of emerging infections and improving general clinical care, whether in primary care or tertiary care, beyond the confines of the intensive care. That, I think, is the really important role for the broad sepsis community and the critical care community. And then the last area that I think is critical and also underestimated and was perhaps best uh, uh, shown through the FEAST trial, looking at fluid management in patients with uh, uh, severe malaria, it's just our ability to look after those patients and make sure uh, 
uh, that they get the best care possible will often c come out of the, the community that, that uh, is represented at this conference. Um, and fluid management, drug resistance and emerging infections are three areas which are often not thought of as central to the critical care community, but which I think absolutely need to be uh, in the future. Uh, so so it's, it's really reframing the role of the critical care sepsis community and thinking not just of the role of those people at this conference in those environments, but just the skills that this community has and making them more widely used and available to everybody across the healthcare system. That is ultimately what is universal health coverage. That is ultimately what will allow the sustainable development goals to be met. And it is critically taking people out of their comfort zone and their own communities and using the skills and expertise you have to deploy in different areas of the healthcare system, which will ultimately underpin a stronger healthcare system for everybody. Um, it's not that I'm saying that the critical care community have been too inward looking, um, but I think a little bit you have, and perhaps you've underestimated the role you can play more broadly across the whole healthcare system, not just within the narrow confines of an intensive care setting. And the other, of course, is that whilst intensive care units have traditionally been in the so-called rich world, the truth is critical care facilities and management of sepsis is now universal. Um, and yet there is not really yet the human resource capacity in all countries of the world to manage and to improve that sepsis management and critical care uh, uh, care. And that therefore brings the last point, which is the critical role the sepsis and critical care community have got in training nurses, paramedics, doctors, outside the de so-called developed world and making those skills more widely available to the low and middle income countries where the growth in the intensive care critical care facilities is going to be in the next 25 years. And I think there's a really important role to be played in moving beyond the sense that this is just the luxury of the developed world and this is something which must and will be available globally. And therefore I think we've all got a responsibility to train the next generation and think at a global level of how we can best use the skills of this community to more to make it available to the maximum number of people globally wherever they are and whatever the facilities they have because many of the features of managing sepsis and critical care patients is actually generic uh, and can be taught uh, both to intensivists but also critically non-intensivists. And for me, that's at the heart of this conference, and it's at the heart of why it's so fantastic that this conference is available totally online, available to everybody, free of charge, and can be used today, and it can be reused tomorrow, and that is the best way of disseminating this sort of expertise and skills to the widest number of people around the world. I wish everybody the greatest success with the conference, uh, and really delighted to, a, to play a very small role in it, uh, but also that the Wellcome Trust is absolutely committed to supporting the, um, the work of the sepsis community and the broader critical care community at a global level. Thank you very much indeed. I think Jeremy has there articulated um, a call to action which is the vision of the Global Sepsis Alliance and the World Sepsis Day movement, that this is a global issue that we need to tackle and that the sepsis community, as I think he rightly has referred to it, which includes not only intensive care, but infectious diseases, um, emergency medicine, pretty much every branch of medicine. And not only we're not only talking about um, physicians here, we're talking about allied health workers, um, other health professionals all around the world, who are working to improve things. And if we can improve sepsis care, we will undoubtedly strengthen healthcare systems in doing that. So for, we're now going to move to um, live presentations. So our first speaker is Professor Mamoun Hamida, who is the State Minister for Health from Khartoum in Sudan, who has been a great supporter of the development of the African Sepsis Alliance, and it's uh, a pleasure to welcome you to the Congress. 
Well, uh, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be contributing to this important uh, activity in our fight against uh, sepsis. Uh, my presentation uh, will be focused on the importance of the political commitment of government and stakeholders in fighting sepsis. Indeed, Sudan has been uh, one of the front runners in uh, the global fight against sepsis. Uh, I say this because uh, we had a, a meeting uh, conference in uh, January uh, 31st in 218, which was attended by uh, dignitaries and uh, Professor Conrad and uh, Professor Dr. Naeem Al Qasabi from the WHO and Emmanuel and uh, the local participants, the chairman of the uh, Fight Against Sepsis Alliance in Sudanese one is Kamal Osman Nerga. Uh, I would like to say first in the first slide that uh, sepsis uh, is uh, one of the important causes, not the only cause of uh, or the highest mortality cause uh, of uh, sepsis in uh, in ICUs. Uh, Khartoum is big. Uh, which uh, harbors at least one third of the population of Sudan uh, is now uh, entertaining uh, an expansion on ICUs in in, uh, in 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 the in the cities, in the three cities of the capital. Uh, so uh, now we have about uh, almost 600 beds of ICU and high dependency units. Uh, still, the mortality is. Uh, uh, very high, uh, and uh, we will expect that 50% of people die from septic in the ICU. So the uh, the alliance, the Sudanese alliance, has been very active and uh, very uh, operative in developing uh, guidelines for awareness, and this has included hospitals and universities and faculties of medicine. Uh, what I would like to say is that the uh, landmark in our fight against sepsis is this meeting, which was held on the 31st of 218. And if you could see in the slide that uh, supporting existing strategic framework for fighting sepsis in Sudan through training, research, and service, and rising awareness, which I'm sure the, one of the, uh, well, the, the conference has really fulfilled. The objective number one was to establish a strengthened collaboration between the national sepsis control and other partners, particularly the Minister of Health. Because if we are talking about a uh, good alliance, um, the uh, Minister of Health and other uh, universities should be part. Objective two, develop a prevention a program, securing funding, collaboration in designing a national policy and then facilitate research in sepsis and gather efforts between partners to design a curriculum for prevention of control and sepsis. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the awareness of the cause of death in ICU and sepsis is being the main cause has not been in, uh, high in the agenda of, uh, of, of the uh, many ministries of health. Next. Uh, the task force recommendations were very clear, and this conference is taken as a spring ball or a spring to Africa. And uh, we are very pleased to have uh, uh, Emmanuel, Professor Emmanuel, this Duby chair of the African Sepsis Alliance, in being in attendance. And uh, Sudan is hosting about 30,000 students from Africa, and we are using those. Uh, students uh, from at least uh, 25 countries from Africa. We are using them as a proxy uh, to distribute awareness uh, programs against sepsis in Africa. So recommendation number one of that conference was suggestion was made to call for a pan-African conference in collaboration with the international uh, bodies which uh, care about control of sepsis and uh, recommendation to sepsis prevention should be taken at three domains, the community, uh, led 
intervention, training and healthcare facility. Recommendation three, take call into action through inviting all other African countries through their ministers of health in order to contact their services providers. Because as uh, the first speaker from, I think, Australia has uh, really mentioned that I think although the uh, Western world is now suffering from this problem and paying a lot with the development of resistance to uh, antibiotics, uh, Africa is going to be the main uh, theme for sepsis in the coming uh, 50 years. Uh, still, we are expanding on ICU in many African countries, and unless awareness is raised and uh, political commitment being gained against substance, I think at the end of the day, we're going to go into back to square one or to the starting point, which our uh, colleagues in the Western world has, has, has been. So uh, the contribution of the universities and uh, development of curricula has been high on the agenda. Uh, then research, obviously, and the uh, audit and quality committee. Next. What has been done up to now? I think uh, before this conference, uh, the Alliance, the Civilian Alliance, has been very active in conducting awareness and training programs in many, in many hospitals, at least in Khartoum. And this included more than uh, 20 hospitals and at least more than three universities raising awareness and uh, programs and days, international days for washing hands, uh, especially in, within the uh, nursing cadre, uh, has been developed. And I'm very pleased to inform the, uh, the audience now and the listeners that uh, this has, has showed some, some effect. And I think we did the smallest studies in some of the ICUs just by insisting and making clear that uh, washing hands is essential, uh, we have seen uh, by evidence that there is a reduction in mortality. Uh, so I think uh, we in the Sudan we are, uh, we are very ready to host an African Sepsis Alliance, and uh, efforts have been done uh, through the African unity uh, that we should invite ministers, and if not ministers, director generals of uh, Minister of Health uh, to come to Khartoum and Khartoum will host such a, a conference, uh, hopefully, uh, to establish a guidelines which will be African, pan African uh, adopted and raising the awareness and changing the curricula of many universities to highlight the importance of fighting sepsis. Yes. Uh, so, Sudan Sepsis Alliance Executive Board adopting uh, recommendation four by addressing all the universities in order to include sepsis in the undergraduate studies as well as specialty boards for postgraduate studies. And this has, we have done uh, some success in this and now many universities have uh, included uh, program and curricular sepsis in, in their, uh, uh, in their curriculum and uh, Sudan Sepsis Alliance Facility Board also was establishing a research and audit quality committee. This is, this is a very long fight, uh, but I think we, we have a start, and I think Sudan can be one of the exemplary countries whereby uh, we could uh, increase awareness among the cadre, the health cadre, not only doctors within the ICU, but others who are really contributing. I think the fourth is to restrict the problem to ICU. It's not true. It's everywhere. And I think uh, just uh, restricting it to ICU will be a mistake. Uh, this is why now the broader uh, look and the broader based uh, approach uh, to changing habits, uh, particularly within the nurses, within the cadre, and even within the cleaners of the world is extremely important. I'm just showing this uh, picture where you can see some uh, people you know, uh, the professor there, uh, Korat, and um, others, the alliance. And importantly, is you are seeing a student who represented the African University. As I early alluded to, that this African University harbors about 30,000 students from different parts of Africa. And we are using 
that university particularly uh, to disseminate information. And most of them are medical students or nursing students or dental students uh, who are going to graduate as doctors uh, in their field and nursing and uh, they will propagate the uh, course of uh, sepsis awareness in Africa. I look forward to seeing some of you uh, in that uh, particular uh, uh, meeting. Uh, here we'll give you the achievements, medical students, more than 1,000 have been uh, raising the awareness and training, nursing about 2,000 and doctors about 2,000. Yes. And uh, this is the conference has, uh, has been uh, February 218 and you could see many, many young people uh, who have contributed and I think we are really targeting the youngsters uh, to lead the way into fighting sepsis, which I think is now uh, there is uh, a major political commitment uh, to fighting it. I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, I wish everybody a, a good uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hamida. I do, there have been quite a number of questions coming through and I hope you'll be able to, to stay on if I could just put yeah. um, uh, some of those to you um, as this is a unique opportunity yeah. for us to question a health minister. Um, so um, one of the questions uh, which I think is very relevant was whether you had any advice to people on how to engage health ministers in their own country to take an interest in sepsis. Well, I think uh, the approach should be through the African unity. We have already started the ball rolling to uh, write the letters uh, through the African unity and we have a contact there uh, to uh, invite them uh, at the ministerial level or at the director level uh, for, for a meeting. And if, if this is successful, I think we can achieve raising the awareness in, in many African countries. Uh, this is have just started and uh, uh, we hope that uh, some of the ministers, at least some of the high officials in Africa will, will accept. Okay, great. And maybe if I just make a brief comment on my, that myself in that the, the WHO um, resolution does call for um, member countries to formulate uh, policies on this. So that resolution itself is perhaps a way that we can approach other national governments in other parts of the world to to take an interest if they are member, the majority will be member states of the United Nations and the WHO. Sure. Um, there were yeah. a number of questions from people wondering about the availability of information and data on um, the epidemiology of sepsis, broadly speaking, um, in Sudan, such as incidence and mortality rates, etc. Um, do you have um, processes that um, provide that such epidemiological data? We have we have data which you are now refining uh, from mainly from ICUs and uh, we have uh, cultures causes of sepsis types of uh, bacteria and the resistance to the various antibiotics. There is limited data because other, otherwise uh, now uh, most of the ICUs are taking care of uh, collecting data. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think that probably mirrors the situation in, in many parts of the world, including in many high-income countries where where we don't have a great deal of data apart from that that has been generated by intensive care units. And obviously, most sepsis arises outside hospitals and we, we need to improve that around the world. Um, is one yeah, other question, if I can just put one last question to you, um, uh, there was a question from one of the audience that uh, you mentioned a a training program and um, for healthcare workers around sepsis and I want and they wondered whether there any of that information was publicly available. Well, uh, uh, do they, they ask about the the curricula or the training, the period of training, and the type of training? 
And the question was Absolutely. around whether any of the resources used for um, training in your hospitals were publicly available. Yes, yes, we have uh, resources available, and the Minister of Health is actually keen about providing that in uh, in, in in many hospitals. Uh, if I understand the question right, uh, so it's uh, the training is ongoing all the time. Uh, and uh, uh, we have now curricula, and uh, actually we have a diploma on um, control and master degree in infection control in some of the universities. Uh, many of those who are working in the ICUs and critical care have been enrolled in this uh, master degree in infection control. Uh, as far as in service training, we are providing a regular in service training for those who are working in high-risk areas. Okay, excellent. I think if we may, perhaps if someone wishes to um, try and uh, access or use some of those information, those methods in their own country, we could direct them to the African Sepsis Alliance yes. unless you have any other particular suggestion who they might contact. No. That, that's, okay. That's uh, I think good. And I think uh, we are ready. We are ready to provide data to, uh, on, on on request. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's. I mean, certainly that. Okay. Um, th or, or even make contact um, with the world through the World Sepsis Day website, and I'm sure we can um, connect people who wish to access those. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Well, okay. Professor. Uh, Hamida, thank you very, very much for contributing to the conference and and also for everything you're doing to improve um, health, uh, the care of people with sepsis throughout Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So we'll move on to our next uh, presentation, which is from Dr. Marcus Friedrich, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the Office of Quality and Patient Safety within the New York State Department of Health. And anyone who is uh, following with interest the quality improvement programs for sepsis around the world and the sepsis literature will be aware that uh, the New York State has um, taken a particular interest in uh, sepsis has enacted some regulations and there are indeed um, quite convincing data that this is producing improvements in uh, the outcome of patients with sepsis in that state. So um, I'd like to hand over now to Dr. Friedrich for the next presentation. Yeah, thank you very much and hi everybody. Um, I just want to highlight um, for those of you who are not familiar with the United States, New York State is the fourth largest state in the United States with about 20 million people and about 200 acute care hospitals. And like most uh, issues um, resolving around uh, quality improvement, um, you know, we started looking at data in 2010 and 2011, and there was a huge variation for in-hospital mortality across all the hospitals. There was also some local interest um, and, uh, you know, the tragic death of Rory Staunton, like a teenager who died of sepsis in New York, really um, had the Commission of Health at that time to make a dr drastic step in enacting sepsis regulation, which are pretty unique um, to, to the United States and um, I guess also worldwide. Um, th we had a three-pronged approach in these regulations. Um, the hospitals had to install adult and pediatric evidence-based protocols for early recognition and treatment. Um, we, as you know, there are many definitions for sepsis. We concentrated on severe sepsis and septic shock uh, for the purpose of hospital data collection. So we didn't think we should define everything new, but we piggybacked on um, the definition. The second approach was to provide training. The hospitals had to provide training to the medical staff on sepsis protocols on adult and pediatrics, and also that um, they should submit data to the Department of Health um, that we then would collect and also give back to the hospitals um, uh, to, um, to somewhat um, ask them for quality improvement. Um, at that same time, you know, we, I'm an internist. I'm not a, you know, sepsis specialist. We created a sepsis advisory group for 
uh, with people inside New York and outside New York to help us think through, you know, the statewide approach on sepsis. We developed the data dictionary and we collect this um, about 70 variables um, quarterly from the hospitals um, on severe sepsis and septic shock, um, including three and six hour bundles. We also concentrated very early on that we also cover the pediatric side, that we are not just concentrating on the adult side. And we started in the second quarter of 2014, and this is ongoing. We have about 215,000 uh, clinical um, sepsis data points in our database right now and about 2,600 pediatric uh, clinical cases. Um, we validate about 10% of the data that comes in from the hospital, and the hospitals are also able to correct the data um, if they found uh, if they find mistakes, and I think the last point, this uh, data sharing back to hospitals, I think was a key uh, key element of the initiative because um, you know we wanted to harness the power of the hospitals um, for their own quality improvement and using the data from the department to go back. And these are some of the protocols. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, three hour and six hour bundle. We used NQF 500 as a guide. Um, and then we also developed a one-hour pediatric bundle um, that um, was also a very interesting process. We could not have done it alone. Um, we have very powerful allies um, in, in these partners that are working with us. Um, and that is another, I think, key element of the New York Sepsis campaign, that um, using collaboration um, inside and outside the department and working together uh, for these goals. And now I want to talk a little bit about our, you know, global approach now um, that is ongoing now in 2018, uh, public reporting. Uh, New York State has a long history of public reporting data um, on their websites back to the hospital and back to the public. We started in 1989, a report on cardiac um, uh, data, and we are still reporting down to the physician level on cardiac surgery, PCI, also congenital um, cardiac surgery. The second is research. Um, we want to support the field of sepsis. As you heard earlier, we have about 215,000 cases now, and I think this is a very um, well-regarded clinical database that we not only use for our own purpose, but also make it available for outside researchers who are interested to um, answer and ask certain questions um, and bring the sepsis field in general forward. And then, of course, quality improvement and the mission of the New York State Department of Health is to improve the life of all New Yorkers. And this is clearly uh, sepsis is one of the major crucial areas um, that we move forward. Uh, we, we report publicly. We, we have this annual report that we just released in March 2018, our second report for 2016. Um, we define quality of care with certain process measures and outcome measures. Um, you see the last report has data on 170 hospitals and we omitted some, you know, smaller hospitals that have less than 10 cases. And we concentrate on like about two thirds of the um, overall septic, uh, severe sepsis and septic shock cases, ED cases only. And this is really, a, 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 you know, these are some data, um, some process data protocol initiated three hour and six hour, uh, hour bundle that we report on every hospital and also the crude mortality rate. Um, as an example, um, you know, what we can do with the data, and we have now, because we have it like two years in a row now, you can see certain outliers, hospitals who are performing worse than others. The yellow are um, somewhere where the performance has declined. The blue show that the performance has improved, and it really allows us um, not only to collect the data, but also share back. And I just want to mention there is a partnership for patient grant from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, that our hospital associations in the state are using for um, developing a hospital improvement network just totally re uh, concerning sepsis. And they work with hospitals customizing some uh, quality improvement aspects and work with um, some of the low-performing hospitals. So overall, we hope to see um, very soon some improvement from that. Um, and then we have outcome measures, um, the adult mortality. And when we started in the second quarter of 2014, um, was 30.2%, and it's down now to 24.9%, like about 5% drop in um, about um, three and a half years that we've seen um, through the adult data on the pediatric side, 
Um, there is more variation. Um, we started with about 10% mortality. We were down to 7% mortality on the pediatric side in the last four quarters. The mortality is slowly rising up again, and we're currently investigating why that is. And to compare hospitals to hospitals, we also developed this risk-adjusted mortality rate um, on a yearly data set. And without going too much into details, here are um, some of the main effect variables. Um, we also use some interaction variables to build the model. Um, we had help with professional data building um, statisticians from um, across the U.S. Um, who helped us with that. And um, that allows us now um, to compare actually hospitals uh, with each other. And this is probably one of the more important charts um, where it shows every single hospital and the mortality um, on the left, you see the low-performing hospitals above the statewide average, and the statewide average is 1.0. And then on the right, you see the high-performing hospitals. Um, there is still variance between low and high, but the variance is uh, clearly going down. Um, this is 2016 data. We have the same data for 2015. And since these are like slightly different models, it's hard to compare them, but you can compare how far the hospitals are from the statewide average. And in 2015, we had uh, 33 hospitals high performance. In 2016, we had 45 hospital high performance. And overall, we're very pleased, um, you know, with the direction that this is taken. Um, we also, um, for future reference, we are trying, um, New York State has a huge initiative about transparency. Um, we're making data available on an open data platform, and we will also include a sepsis data set, an aggregated uh, de-identified hospital sepsis data set, um, to, to give uh, people just a first glance at sepsis in general. This is not the complete data set that we make uh, uh, available for researchers, but um, overall, um, this is you know a quite unique feature of uh, New York State. And then um, the second big point is research. Um, uh, was mentioned, um, we, we were very active. We worked with, um, you know, Chris Seymour and um, his team and Haley Prescott from Michigan um, on, on this New England Journal of Medicine paper that just looked at adult sepsis and um, really clearly showed that r rapid completion of a three-hour bundle and antibiotic was associated with a lower risk-adjusted mortality. And the longer you take to give actually um, this three-hour bundle, the higher the mortality, which was pretty unique. And then this year, um, we had a drama paper about PD, just con concerning the pediatric papers, looking at uh, 1,200 cases about, and it was also even there that, um, you know, the in-hospital mortality increased by 2% each hour where the bundle was not completed, which is also another, you know, key factor in thinking about, you know, providing uh, timely sepsis care to people. And then we are thinking about, you know, other research examples, racial and ethnic disparities, um, is always important for the Department of Health. Readmission is a key, um, you know, feature that we are looking at right now. And then, of course, the main question, if these mandated protocols actually had an impact or not compared to other states. And we are working with, you know, another team outside New York to actually answer that question. And then last but not least, um, quality improvement. Um, uh, opportunity to improve and save life is still the main driver um, for the Department of Health. Um, this is um, clearly, you know, our goal uh, to make an impact, um, foster the research and, you know, improve lives. Um, look at risk populations, but also share clinical practices is another key element. Uh, CMS is also measuring um, sepsis um, with, with their measures, and um, we are working collaborative with them, as well as, you know, in-state um, with the hospital associations and uh, foundations such as the Rory Staunton Foundation and the Home, Her Home Care Association. Um, and then, of course, um, relationships between now this protocol adherence and the specific interventions, sharing of best practices, and then also, again, um, looking at outcome, relative outcome measures for children. Uh, the pediatric population is uh, somewhat, um, I wouldn't say neglected, but there's much less research on the pediatric, and we are trying to, you know, with our clinical data set also to push this um, forward and think about is, is mortality a good outcome measure or are there other outcome measures than we you know, participating in certain work groups here in the state and international to do that. So this is it for me. Um, thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, the 
I, for one, and I'm sure many people around the world have followed what's been going on in New York with with great interest as we think about how we might improve the sepsis care in our own systems. Um, I, I have a couple of questions for you. One of really goes to how granular and how detailed the data are, and do you, you the you obviously have data that suggests that some hospitals are not performing so well. Do you have any idea of where the key areas in terms of maybe improving that performance might be? Yeah, we, we are currently looking at that and investigating that. Um, one of the key elements that we found is the identification of sepsis cases in general. And this goes mm -hmm. back to the difference between, you know, clinical indicators or do you go later into a database and look at um, ICD-9 or 10 codes and identify the sepsis cases. And there is a difference in uh, mortality. Probably the claims-based data um, underestimates the mortality, um, where the clinical data is more specific. So this is a key indicator. And there is some um, also efforts from the CDC in Atlanta to look at um, I, the identification of sepsis cases and help hospitals to um, build a framework that um, there's also um, in, in the United States in general, um, there are uh, electronic health record vendors who are helping now to build a computerized system that signal, um, you know, probability of sepsis. And I think these are all you know, great approaches to think about um, the granularity and identifying sepsis early and also treating um, the, the cases early. Mm -hmm. And I guess another area that we're all becoming more and more interested in, certainly um, in, in high-income countries, is the longer-term outcomes for, for patients with sepsis. Do you... Do you also look at that maybe through data linkages, et cetera? Yeah. Um, or are you we, still very focused on hospital-based outcomes no, and mortality? I, I, think, I think this is um, a great um, example, and we are taking that next step and using or trying to link our uh, sepsis database. We have you know, an extensive home health um, network database um, in New York State that we are reporting to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid. And we are, um, you know, starting like a bigger project to look at these um, linkages, people who were in nursing homes, then had a sepsis episode, and then going back to nursing homes and thinking about the longer effects of sepsis. And I think the data is, um, you know, really, really interesting. I, I wish I would have something to share with you right now. I don't, but um, there's active um, research going on inside the department and also outside with collaborators. And um, maybe finally, um, obviously, I, was in, I wasn't aware that the data were publicly available. So, <laughs> excuse me, the data can be, um, or access to the data can be requested by researchers from outside the U United States. Yeah, and we have, um, I, I, I have on my last slide, there are some links, um, and this is, um, available, um, you know, there are data request forms that we put up. Um, we are, I think, in the final stages, um, like quickly before the release. I'm, I haven't been in the office the last week and a half, but I know that um, there were the final touches. So anybody can download that and, and ask for um, access of the data. And we have a process in place with our sepsis advisory group, go through the proposals, and then um, discuss um, if this is bringing the field forward and um, then hopefully make the data in some form available for outside researchers. Uh, the last mm -hmm. thing we want to do to sit on the data and, um, you know, uh, and stifle some of the um, interesting questions that are, you know, can be answered with a data set like that. And so we are, you know, actively trying to promote um, research on this data. Well, I think that... We'd all agree that that's a fantastic initiative and fantastic that you're making the data available to people. We had a question earlier about how we might influence um, ministers of health, etc., in different countries around the world where they're not yet interested in this problem. 
Um, and I think um, what you have done is given an excellent example of of a, a system that is working a, a, a changing things is always very difficult and also the data that you are publishing is I think a, a very very strong message to other parts of well not a, in the world as a whole about how that we can improve outcomes from this so I'd like to um, <coughs> excuse me on thank you very much for both your presentation for the work you're doing and for um, your a global public health um, initiative there in making these data available to people who want to use them to answer some of the important questions. So thank you very much indeed for your contribution. You're welcome. Um, thank you. And uh, the, the final presentation we have in this session is from someone who can take great personal um, responsibility for the um, World Sepsis Day movement for the Global Sepsis Alliance and for this um, Congress, and that's the current uh, uh, president of the world um, of the Global Sepsis Alliance, uh, Professor Conrad Reinhardt from, I think we could say, Jena and Berlin in Germany. So, Conrad, it's great to welcome you to um, what we might call your Congress. Oh, it's our Congress uh, from the whole community. And I think we, what we have heard from the previous uh, speakers, that really uh, the WHO resolution was a, a quantum leap in the fight against sepsis because it acknowledges the tremendous human medical and economic burden of sepsis. It stresses that most sepsis deaths are preventable by simply simple low-cost measures, and it helps to overcome some misconceptions on sepsis and urges, most importantly, uh, to tackle sepsis on the national community and healthcare provider uh, level. And as it's very helpful too to make really uh, sepsis a global health priority and this in a such help to get sepsis there ne, to the public and the political space, as Sir Lyon Donaldson has said, the place where sepsis needs to be in order to think uh, to change, and this was all about. But the challenges are indeed now to enact the resolution, to make it happen on the government level, on the healthcare authorities level, on the healthcare providers level, and on the level of caregivers and the community. And doing so, uh, it's very helpful that the resolution also acknowledges that not only bacteria, but most types of microorganisms like fungi, viruses, and parasites, parasites such as the malaria, can cause uh, sepsis. And this was not clear, uh, within, even within WHO and some centers of disease control. And it's also very helpful that it's now broadly acknowledged that sepsis is a syndromic response to infection and the final common pathway to death from most infectious diseases, and this helps to overcome some misconceptions that, that are out there, that sepsis occurs only in the healthcare setting, or results only from ugly care, or is primarily caused by multi-resistant bacterial uh, bugs. It helps the understanding that it is mostly from common and also preventable infections. We have heard the numbers that are around now on the incidence of sepsis on a global scale and the numbers of deaths. And as these numbers are all derived mostly uh, from high income countries, and we know that the number of deaths in low resource settings are much higher from infections, are much higher than in high in income countries, these numbers are probably tremendously underestimated, and even uh, new data from Sweden and also from the United States suggest that the numbers on incidence per 100,000 population, which we thought would be around 300 to 350 per 100,000 population, are almost doubled as, as high. So we will see, hopefully, in the next Global Burden of Disease Report, more 
and better uh, data on the burden of sepsis. It's also great that this resolution uh, refers to the health economic burden of sepsis and reports on the fact that in the US, 27 billion US dollars are spent simply on the treatment of sepsis patients in the hospitals, which we are all aware is not the end because uh, sepsis in the survivors goes along with a huge number of uh, disabilities, disabilities. And the great thing about the resolution, of course, is also that as we have seen today and we'll see to the course of this Congress, that it fosters the involvement of WHO uh, in, in the fight against uh, sepsis. And it's great that uh, Dr. Tetros called it a tragedy that most of the 6 million deaths uh, from sepsis are preventable and not only preventable, but also the disabilities that come around. And uh, you heard Dr. Uh, Yamamoto already uh, talking and we she we convened uh, a congress uh, uh, a technical expert meeting in Geneva in January where she was present with quite a number of people uh, from around the globe just to discuss the best strategy to really enact this resolution and major requests there were indeed and decisions to have a global awareness campaign on sepsis and a global action plan uh, uh, on sepsis and also to speak more about sepsis in the great initiatives which are around by WHO and the United Nations. And one shining example um, on this was the that for the first time the hand hygiene campaign, which is done annually by WHO in this year, clearly referred uh, to sepsis in this way, as you see and you may, may have heard about. So when I'm talking about these uh, high-profile campaigns as sustainable development goals or global action plan against antimicrobials or the WHO patient safety network and the global action plan for healthy life and well-being for all, which was mentioned by uh, Chancellor Minister uh, Brown this morning. Uh, in all these plans so far, ironically, uh, this program, uh, the term sepsis is not yet mentioned, and this does not follow the recommendation, again, of the resolution that we need to talk more, uh, also not only in communication with patients on sepsis, but also uh, among our ourselves. What also is encouraged uh, by the sepsis resolution is that we need to overcome the disparities in the quality of health care, both in the various regions in the world, and it's unacceptable that, for example, in Brazil and Turkey, hospital mortality is between 55 and above Sixty uh, percent, but interestingly and shocking uh, for me, being from Germany, is the fact that sepsis mortality in my country is in this is ICU treated patients more than twenty percent higher than in Australia, in, in England, and uh, UK. And we have to, to 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 overcome this. And you have seen and heard about the data um, on. Pediatric sepsis mortality, which between 2012 and 2016 in the New York State was 11.8%, and it could be reduced to 7.5% uh, by the great campaign which was uh, launched uh, by uh, Governor Cuomo uh, in, in 2013 to, to 7.5%. Um, and in Germany, a, a country which has similar resources, even more ICU beds than U.S., and definitely more hospital beds, and more doctor's consultations than the U.S., and the mortality in this age group is 7.2%. So this is not acceptable, as it's not acceptable that in the state New York, if you go to these hospitals here, 
uh, your likelihood to die is much higher than if you get care in these hospitals here. And we have pretty much similar data uh, for Germany who reflect that also within Germany there are great differences in uh, sepsis uh, uh, outcomes. The resolution also urges to increase awareness and improve education of lay people on sepsis. And, this, and we know from polls, which are representative of for whole Germany, that uh, only 19% of people um, think that they can protect themselves against sepsis by vaccination against the pneumococci and influenza. Uh, 23% think sepsis is an allergic reaction, and most of them think that that it is this red stripe which um, travels uh, from the hand to the heart, uh, which is the, the key sign and symptom of sepsis, and nobody uh, really knows, or most of people don't know, uh, the most important uh, signs of early uh, sepsis. And if you look at these numbers on the rates uh, of um, vac vaccination rates between Germany and these numbers that I have shown you have lower more sepsis mortality, you see that in these countries it's more than twice uh, as higher than in Germany, and this is also true for bronchococci, and this may be one reason, not definitely not the, 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 the only reason uh, on, on the, for these absurd differences. The question is how did we get there? Uh, to this uh, solution, and uh, it, it was definitely the case of the involvement of sepsis survivors, and it's rightly so that also the resolution asks that we need to do much more to enhancing sepsis survivorship. So in every country or most countries, you have programs for rehabilitation after stroke, after the myocardial infarction, uh, after uh, cancer, but this is not the case uh, for sepsis, and this needs also to be uh, changed. The resolution is also a, a, quite a good template for national action plans uh, and to suggest these different areas uh, that need to be addressed if we want to make uh, a difference. And what is well known uh, from quite a number of countries that I already have mentioned, what the characteristics and the specifics are who have the, in these countries who have really a low mortality rate. So it's indeed effective programs on infection prevention and control. They systematically train healthcare workers in early detection of deteriorating patients. They have implemented early warning scores even on the national level uh, in Australia, rapid response teams are mandatory, so no hospital gets accredited by the government if they don't have it, and also critical incident reporting is mandatory. And this is missing in many countries, as uh, in many countries or most countries, there are no specific quality improvement campaigns and neither is the education uh, on, of lay people on the prevention and early signs uh, knowledge of, on the early signs uh, of sepsis. So these programs must really become core of every uh, national sepsis plan that uh, this resolution asks for and also the GSA asks for. And uh, these programs that happen and are effective in, in the US, in UK, would not be there uh, without the engagement uh, of uh, families who have lost, uh, lost their last one uh, and uh, have survived uh, uh, sepsis. And they were very crucial uh, to convince high-ranked uh, policymakers, some of them have already spoken or will speak uh, during this conference, uh, on the yeah, importance uh, of our our common uh, case, and just to sh show only one very convincing example, 
um, uh, is that in, Af in UK every family now gets information when they have a newborn uh, in, in their family on how to address what the early signs of sepsis are, et cetera, et cetera. And this must happen uh, everywhere. You have seen this data uh, by Markus Friedrich, which I can uh, skip because it demonstrates how successful uh, one can be. Uh, again, coming back to Germany, we failed uh, in, a, in, a, in a big trial uh, and quality improvement uh, initiative with 40 hospitals that because we were not able to change the number of uh, patients who received the antimicrobials within the first hour and not surprisingly mortality remained unchanged and what we found out when we asked these hospitals about the reasons they said lack of supporting by key stakeholders within the hospital be it the board but be it the members of the other Departments, and this is much different uh, in quite a huge number of hospitals in the US and in, 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 in other countries where the leadership is committed and all in this, and this is not only Northwell, uh, they were able to, to halven uh, their sepsis mortality, and this is the way to go. This is also possible in Germany, although this is just one big hospital at the University of Greifswald where the commitment uh, of uh, young colleagues who were able to engage the whole hospital, they were able also to reduce sepsis mortality by almost 20% over the years. So why? that's why the strategy of the GSA is, as already mentioned by Simon earlier, uh, to, to have regional sepsis alliance uh, every in every part of the world where also WHO has regional uh, offices uh, to closely collaborate on the national levels to encourage the, the countries in this respective area to set out national sepsis plans and also to have a global action, action plan. And it's good to see and to know that uh, quite a number of countries have taken up these uh, suggestions, and at the end, I would like to thank all of you around the globe who have helped to make uh, all this uh, happen. And it's true that nothing is so powerful than an idea whose time has come, and definitely to improve the quality of sepsis care is an, uh, an idea whose time has come. And I would like to encourage you to, to share and to join this find and to ch share our vision. Uh, for a world free of sepsis. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, comrade. Um, obviously, uh, that is a vision that uh, we uh, we discussed whether this is possible, and certainly it is a vision to, that we could work towards. There have been a, a couple of questions. Um, there's been a fair bit in the in the uh, public audience chat about multi-resistant organisms, about carbapenem resistant organisms. <clears throat> there are presentations later in the conference that go specifically to some of those issues, um, which if they're in a time zone that's not suited to someone, obviously everything can be downloaded or watched on, on the podcast or on the YouTube channel later. Um, so there was, Conrad, the general question um, from Saudi Arabia about the apparent conflict with um, the only thing that we really know or the thing that we know is very important to reduce mortality, which is early recognition and early treatment with appropriate antibiotics. And the fact that that seems to be in conflict with um, the, our, another major goal to reduce antimicrobial resistance. Uh, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think it's all about antimicrobial stewardship, but antimicrobial stewardship does not only mean to stop, steps, uh, to, to stop antimicrobials as early as possible, but also to give it as fast as possible um, when you have the signs uh, of infection, especially the sign uh, of, of sepsis. And that's why I was saying that these, the, the global action plans again, plan against antimicrobial resistance must be closely combined just to educate people well on both sides of this coin. 
I think that that it occurs to me that that's somewhere where the data from the New York State might be help. There is already um, good data coming out of um, places such as Ireland, and and we have mm -hmm. uh, Vida Hamilton from Ireland talking yeah. later in the conference. There's very good data coming out of Ireland that putting in place a sepsis uh, pathway protocol, early recognition, early administration of antibiotics actually reduces the total amount of antibiotic prescribed and administered and reduces antimicrobial yeah. resistance. So although it appears these things are in conflict, um, the data suggests that they are not. And it's not surprising because we know when people have um, advanced sepsis that's treated late, they tend to um, be in our hospitals and be treated for a long time with long courses of antibiotics, um, even though they have higher mortality. So mm -hmm. I think it is not just um, a simple matter of if we treat people early with antibiotics, we'll increase resistance because the data don't support that. Yeah, um, data from UK to yeah. Yes, so certain, certainly that is the, the case. Um, there, there were other um, questions. Um, I'm not. I think you've articulated very well the the variations in practice. One of the things was was possibly we could um, broadly talk about um, variations in you know society and lifestyle effects, etc., and whether we should focus also our efforts um, on. Um, more broadly, and I guess some of that is contained within the within the um, WHO resolution, rather than just focusing ourselves on the bedside clinical management of sepsis, but very much more on the broader societal approach to reducing sepsis. I think you've yep. covered that. Did you want to make any additional comment on that? No, I, I, I think this is definitely true that. Uh, um, um, if you treat appropriately diabetes, uh, if you uh, educate people in healthy living, avoiding uh, nicotine and too much alcohol and stuff like this, so that, that also contributes, of course, um, to yeah, to, to 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 be more resistant against infections that finally may. Uh, end up, and there's this interesting data being presented also in this congress by a colleague uh, who derives from India that even uh, nutrition uh, by some kind of probiotics or symbiotics um, may reduce uh, sepsis mortality in, in, in neonates. So there are many societal aspects, and uh, including nutrition, uh, even also perhaps on the ICU, who who need to take be taken into account mm -hmm. okay I think <coughs> excuse me I'm trying to fight off sepsis myself at the moment um, there's an interesting comment that just came I'm not sure from which country but it says how can I as a medical student influence my country where there is no awareness of sepsis um, did you uh, I have my own opinion on that Com uh, Conrad, but did you want to comment? Yeah, yeah you, 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 you see that we are jointly with Charles Gomersol, um, uh, on on the way to develop a, a curricula to educate students worldwide, and you uh, and this definitely every medical school around the globe uh, should adopt uh, such uh, uh, programs, and this would be my approach and uh, interestingly also the World Federation of Medical Students is a supporter of the Global Sepsis Alliance and we have heard about Africa that this African university is very dedicated to spread this message in, in, in Africa. So so we, we definitely need to identify our collaboration uh, with the uh, students and the medical faculties in this respect. Yeah, so I think my take on on that would be that um, everybody starts somewhere and, and someone once said, could a small group of committed people really change the world? And the answer to that was, it's the only thing that ever has. So I think if you, and and it is really hard 
to change the behavior or, or to get leadership from people who are right at the end of their career. And I would think that it, as a medical student, um, if you get together with a group of your uh, of like-minded colleagues, um, you have a potential to affect a great deal of change. And we're seeing through um, various, you know, congresses and through social media and other matters um, that a lot of um, medical students and what would in the past have maybe considered relatively uninfluential, more junior um, health practitioners, not just uh, I think it's very important that we don't just focus on um, doctors and physicians in this discussion, but a great deal of healthcare around the world is, is delivered by by other healthcare workers, um, and they are just as important and can be just as effective in improving outcome. Um, I think we're getting very close to, to the end. Um, it's been very gratifying as the chair of this session, A, to follow the chat and see people saying hello from all over the world, from places that are very, very early in the morning to other places like where I am, where it is getting very close towards the end of the day. I think if um, I may, I will just um, give a brief overview of what we've heard, um, which has been recognition by politicians and important global and regional organizations such as the WHO, the EU, uh, in Africa, the uh, African states, uh, Sudan, the African Sepsis Alliance, and in New York State as, as one, you know, the fourth largest state in, in the USA, recognizing the importance of sepsis and the importance of developing uh, better methods of recognition, prevention, and treatment. An excellent example from New York State, which is, you know, it's not one size fits all, but they have put in place a, a, a program, a mandated program that involves training, identification, um, treatment pathways, the collection of data, feedback to hospitals on their performance, which is very important, public reporting, and making publicly available, including to people outside of the USA, their database, um, which one one can apply for research purposes, um, as one model that, as uh, um, the data tells us, has clearly improved outcomes in that state. Not the only model, as we'll hear later in the Congress, about some other quality improvement initiatives that are happening in other parts of the world, different models that are equally effective. And a call to action, really, from Jeremy Farrar um, for the sepsis community in its broadest sense to be a vehicle of change within health systems and uh, a way that we can strengthen health systems around the world. Um, and whilst we, I, we are very much focused on the, the scourge of sepsis, it's clear that if we improve sepsis care, um, we are, can't really fail to be improving the function of our healthcare systems. Um, and with 85% of the world's population living in low middle income countries where much of the burden of sepsis resides, it's clear that those are areas um, that we at uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance and the, in, within the World Sepsis Day movement would, li would be like to see a a lot of focus and a, a lot of action. And this collaboration, and this Congress is a part of that, this global collaboration where we all work together and we don't take a nationalistic approach to this, but work as a global community to improve outcomes all around the world. So I'm going to um, finally, if I could have the survey slide up, on the screen, there is a um, survey um, that um, is available on the um, the slide just going up there. It's a very brief survey. If you go to uh, www.worldsepsisday.org um, forward slash survey as shown on the screen now, you can take uh, an eight to ten minutes to complete an anonymous 
survey to uh, tell us how sepsis is being measured and treated in in your country in in your, in your locality and this will be these data will be put together and will be another powerful tool to help us to get greater uh, government um, and uh, uh, in, engagement in the fight against sepsis and also obviously will help us to gain additional research funding um, so that we can further work out how best to treat that. And my final duty before closing is to thank um, <coughs> our sponsors because obviously this is uh, it is it is not without cost, financial cost, to put on an event such as this, and without the uh, sponsors um, who I won't list but are displayed there on the screen, who have made generous um, financial contributions with no strings attached to this congress, so that we can put this on and allow people from all around the world to join, and for us to make this freely available after the event online. So thank you very much to our sponsors without who this would not be possible. Um, so I would just uh, like to thank all our contributors to the meeting, to the first session, some of whom uh, due to work commitments or time zone issues, etc., couldn't be here in, present, in person, but still made a, a very valuable contribution to this and to the participants. Uh, it's been great to watch all the chat going on and we look forward to uh, the rest of the, the con conference over the next two days. And the content of each session will be made available online fairly soon um, after the conclusion of each session if you have missed some that you would like to go back and revisit. So thank you very much to everybody for taking part. And I will be back to give a brief talk and also we'll be listening in uh, to the other excellent presentations from a fantastic group of speakers over the next two days. So thank you and goodbye.